Idaho lawmakers were supposed to hear firsthand how Idaho's abortion bans are damaging Idaho's health care system. But those firsthand meetings were canceled, apparently because of what went down last week, with the Democrats being demonstrative about it. ITD's budget is going back to square one, putting into question the nearly $52 million sale of the old headquarters. And that could be bad business in the eyes of developers. You know, we like to celebrate big birthdays here on the 208. Today's birthday is one you might recognize, Idaho's Bluebird Man, who recounts decades dedicated to the state bird. You know, we've been hearing for months from hospitals, doctors, even patients. Idaho's abortion ban and the associated laws have had a strong negative impact on our health care system. OBGYNs and maternal medicine experts have been leaving the state with none coming in to take their place. Since the laws are too vague and restrictive and many are just choosing to not deal with it. We've been hearing about it and sharing it with you. And today, Idaho lawmakers were supposed to hear it directly how the laws they passed have left Idaho in the lurch when it comes to maternal and fetal care. Doctors were supposed to present their case, illustrate the impact to both the Senate and House Health and Welfare Committees. Supposed to, but that meeting was canceled. Why? Here's Joe Paris. Early Monday morning, a press release lands in inboxes, an event set for the State House. Doctors and experts telling lawmakers about the impacts of Idaho's abortion laws. Impacts on the workforce, impacts on staffing, impacts across the board. Hours later, though, an update. The event is canceled. I think by any objective standards, Idaho's abortion law has been a disaster. House Minority Leader, Democrat Representative Alana Rubel, was looking forward to the event, a chance, she says, to connect lawmakers with the reality of Idaho. We have hemorrhaged doctors out of the state. We've lost 55% uh, of our high-risk maternity specialists. We've lost about a quarter of our OBGYNs. We've had three labor and delivery services shut down entirely. Monday afternoon, word started around the state house. The event with medical stakeholders is called off. Official reason in the press release, legislative leadership needed to focus on concluding the session. I think the order came from Republican leadership. Um, you know, I wasn't in the room when they did it. Uh, they're trying to blame the Democrats for this. They're trying to say it's because we raised the flag and said, hey, we need to fix Idaho's abortion laws. Republican Representative Megan Blanksma has a different perspective from across the aisle. I think it was called off because the chairman and some of the members of the committee were really frustrated at the press conference on Friday. That press conference was held back on Friday by the House and Senate Dems. The topic, Idaho's abortion laws. Didn't give out a completely accurate uh, explanation of the situation. So the Democrats came out and they had a press conference and basically called Republicans names. And I think that's when the chairman got frustrated and reasonably so because a lot of the things that were asserted in the press conference simply weren't true. Blanksma understands how delicate the conversations on the topic are, but she believes across the aisle, the temperature is being cranked up unnecessarily. I think part of the reason that we're having such difficulty is the fear mongering that's coming out of the left in scaring people. And we need to do our best to let folks know that no, Idaho believes in healthy families and we're doing our best to support that. We want to make sure that legislators hear the voices of physicians and, and frontline health care providers as far as what's going on and how this is impacting their day to day care. Dr. Lauren Colson was supposed to speak to lawmakers at the event. Here's what he wanted to convey. Just here's what it's like. Here are the struggles that we're having right now. And so that our legislators can know uh, on a firsthand basis what it's like for us as physicians right now. He believes some lawmakers will remain in the dark, not knowing what they don't know as a result of the canceled event. Uh, lawmakers who in their own right aren't medical experts um, are sometimes having a difficult time understanding why we can't just stop doing abortions and continue providing OB care and reproductive care as we were uh, before just without abortion and just to, to explain those situations and those complications that arise that uh, maybe they didn't think of before when this law was passed. For lawmakers, time is running out for the 2024 session. Still, Democrats and Republicans know there's a major conversation that needs to continue. I think they were really afraid of the information that was going to come out of this hearing. Um, and I think they were afraid of having more of a spotlight shone on essentially the disaster they have created with this abortion law. They were trying to have a, a conversation, to try to come together, get us all on the same page. And then they felt like essentially a bomb went off and, and then it gets difficult to have the discussion. So now you're going to have a committee hearing after a press conference that 
isn't about having the discussion, and that's what it was supposed to be all along. Another factor in all of this is IVF, in vitro fertilization. You may have seen the news in the state of Kentucky, their abortion laws inadvertently or intentionally, depending on who you ask, it actually criminalized IVF or in vitro fertilization. So here in the gem state, there's been a lot of talk about it. And part of the problem between the Republicans and the Democrats is on the House floor last week, there was a speech made by Representative Brooke Green, a Democrat, and she basically said that I have a, a piece of legislation that's going to get read right across the desk, but we need to have IVF in state code. And Brian, kind of the hiccup in this whole thing is that there was a petition that was circulated, and I know you can't see it, but take my word, there's a petition that was circulated across the state house that essentially says, okay, we, we understand that IVF is important. We want to make sure that Idaho families can use IVF. And there is, uh, the way that they say it is that after a diligent legal inquiry, they've concluded that there's no statutory obstacle to the continued offering of this important option. Basically saying, we don't need to make a law about IVF because it's legal, our abortion laws don't mess with that. Hmm. Some people, some some Republicans were upset that Representative Green got on the floor and, and the word impugn comes up, kind of talking about what, you know, Republicans could believe on IVF. So the whole thing kind of is very messy and in very complicated situation. So we don't need a law about something that isn't happening in Idaho. Got that. <laughs> Write that down. Okay. I guess my question for Representative Blanksmith, though, is... Is it fear-mongering from the left if it's coming directly from the doctors? And, and that's, a, that's a, it's a good question, but uh, Representative Blanksma also wanted to add into the conversation that there are things, especially that she's carried, that take care of pregnant women and make sure that, that pregnant women in Idaho are taken care of. It didn't make the story, but a soundbite that I have with Representative Blanksma that says, if we're going to live in the condition that we, we've created with the abortion laws, we need to take care of women. So I think there were some in the Republican camps that say, I, I don't know if there was attention given to what we are doing. So... Depends on who you ask. Okay. All right. Thanks, Joe. Well, Idaho legislature is adding rungs to the ladder they need to climb before they can go home for the session. Supposed to be. Original date was, I guess, last week. Pushing it back to this week. We'll see what happens because today the Senate returned two budgets back to committee because, as Senate leadership said on the floor, both bills have the same problem, which is that. What yeah. are those problems, I should say? Well, so we talked about yesterday. There's that specific clause in the transportation budget, and it's not just in the transportation budget. There's an administrative budget that goes along with that, too, and that passed the House by a single vote, ITD budget specifically. But the Senate pumped the brakes today, sending it back to square one. It will catch up on the basics here. In January of 2022, a frozen pipe burst and flooded the ITD State Street headquarters. Later that year, ITD declared the building a surplus. By September of 23, a group of companies won a public bid for the property. They offered nearly $52 million. The state even drafted a sales agreement. But this ITD, ITD budget explicitly revokes the agency's ability to go through with that sale. So JFAC leadership says it's fiscally responsible to keep the building and renovate the building. But others in the legislature say that's bad business to go back on your word. And it's a feeling that is echoed by developers in the area. And they fear that getting burned by the state on the future deals a possibility. A career in real estate reveals a few foundational truths. You buy into the market which you sell into. And Dave Wally's fingerprints are everywhere. City center that you see downtown. He's the managing partner of Gardner and has no problem finding work. Probably hadn't seen that many cranes, you know, in the air. But he's focused on finding the right work. There were definitely uh, a large number of new developers to the market who were willing to take risks bigger than some of the local folks. Dave says that drove up a nine bid race on the public auction for ITD's flooded headquarters on State Street. The winners offered nearly $52 million. I think they got a very fair price out of it. But it's unclear if they'll collect or if the deal will finalize at all. As written, the state's transportation budget revokes ITD's right to sell. I wouldn't expect it from any state. You know, I'm of a mindset that when you make a deal, you make a deal. It may not be the deal you, you know, that you thought you made at the beginning, but it's still the deal you decided on. Lawmakers are stuck in a debate between supporting their colleagues or keeping the state's word and reputation. If I feel like there's an opportunity for the state to retrade the deal, why would I spend the money and energy to go make the bid. That reality pushed the transportation budget for the request is there an objection back to where it started. There none that is so ordered. Meaning the Senate agrees revoking the right to sell could use a second set of eyes. In my opinion needs to be changed. Lawmakers must pass agency budgets before the end of the session 
and plan to work quick, nearing their self-imposed deadline. Time right now, I think, matters to all of us. Time matters in the private sector, too, just by a different name. Truth be told, money. Well, I think at this point, the legislature is going to do what the legislature is going to do. And in turn, the development community may not look at offerings that the state provides, which means in the future they won't have as many bidders for projects, which means they may not get the highest price. So they'll have to reassess that in the future. Now, when this budget passed the House by a single vote, the House JFAC chair, that's Representative Wendy Horman, defended revoking the sale because the working group in JFAC decided financially that was the best move. And JFAC could change the language mm -hmm. on what this says, and I guess those two bills now, they could choose not to change it and throw it back to the House and try it over again. But I admit I'm not fully convinced that exact same budget would pass the House again because right. there were lawmakers that apologized voting for it the first time. Well, if they get a second vote on it... It was one they... vote, correct? Yeah, it was one vote. It was one vote. And I, I understand the whole idea of, like, let's hold on to this piece of property and get more down in the future. It's a long-term deal as opposed to just selling right now. Yeah. But the reputation thing, and to say, oh, that's not going to happen here, which is kind of what we're hearing with the abortion stuff as well. It seems like there's a little bit of that, that denial, I guess you would. Perhaps. All right. Thanks, Andrew. The mountain bluebird first became Idaho's state bird 93 years ago, which is almost as old as the Idaho man who spent the second half of his life saving them. So today we're saving some time to celebrate the bluebird man's birthday. All right, this is the part of the show where we ask you to be part of it. Text us, 208-321-5614. Always include your name and the hashtag the 208. And if yours is clean, concise, and well, kind of clever, we might show yours at the end of the show. Al Larson first came to the great state of Idaho at the age of three, but he didn't quite settle in right away. His stepdad was a pastor, so his family moved around a lot. For example, in second grade, he attended four separate schools, and by the time he hit junior high, well, the family finally made Idaho his home. And maybe he learned how to be comfortable with all that moving around, and maybe that's the reason he found a passion in a species with a mobile lifestyle that kind of matched his early years, the mountain bluebird. But there's certainly two reasons Al Larson became known as Idaho's Bluebird Man. His care for conservation of the bluebird and his longevity in doing it. Which is fitting since today, Al is celebrating 99 years after he first stepped foot in the gem state. We first met Al Larson in July of 1992. They call him the Bluebird Man. We've got uh, four baby mountain bluebirds about uh, five days old. Then he was 68 and checking in on his many bluebird boxes across southwestern Idaho. At this age, I, I just leave them alone. They're uh, kind of small to put a band on. And today... And I kept uh, track of everything that happened in all the boxes. Al still remembers how many birds he banded. All told, uh, 
uh, I think it's uh, around 31,400 bluebirds that I put bands on. I got to be noted at, known as a bluebird man. <laughs> Do you like that? Oh, I don't mind it. Yeah, people still call me the bluebird man. Al's interest in photography feathered into his interest in Idaho State Bird in 1978 when he lived near Idaho City. I was out for a walk when I noticed a, a bluebird going into a natural cavity in a tree. Thought, well, if I could put up a box like they have back east, I could have them a captive bird that I could take pictures of. And so I started putting boxes up. Do you know how many you put up, like over your time, over your lifetime? Oh, I must have, it's close to 360. <laughs> Al records when each nest is built, tallies the eggs, how many of them hatch, and the number of bluebird young that fledge from the nest. Al says he once had bluebird boxes in six different Idaho counties, and he would check them all when he was well into his 90s. When was the last time you were out checking boxes? Uh about three years ago. I can tell you almost For exactly decades, how time I, and age given a little measurement here was just about numbers for Al. That's about 49 millimeters. These guys are about 12 days old. But this day Today is my birthday. One, 102. It's a big number. I told people that I finished my first century and I'm working on my second. <laughs> Mobility may become an issue in your second century. Thousands and thousands of birds have seen me go by. But that hasn't kept Al from seeing his birds. And right now, I have a windows on my bedroom where I spend most of my time with feeders right outside the window. So I've got birds coming in to visit me all day. So I think, well, I've got my friends coming up to see me anyhow, but bird friends. <laughs> I'm in the cage and they're outside. <laughs> As for the legacy he built with the mountain and western bluebirds? I guess uh, I like bluebirds uh, to work with bluebirds because they, they accept me. They accept people probably more than a lot of the other songbirds do. It's always been about helping. And I can help them. It just seems like I'm reaching out and helping somebody in need. I think it, uh, it helps a person realize his place in life if he uh, gets close to these birds, other wildlife, and see how they live. And if you help them out, then you have a more direct part in it. And that hasn't changed for Al Grown. 34 years later. What do you want people to know about what you've done for those decades? Well, learn more about nature. Get out and see the, the birds, see the animals, see the flowers, learn everything you can about nature. <laughs> Al's efforts have certainly not gone unnoticed. He was the subject of an Emmy-nominated documentary a few years ago. And according to the American Breeding Bird Survey, the mountain bluebird population has declined a bit, but has remained relatively steady since 1966 and 2019. As for who is checking his bird boxes these days, Al told us, the man who used to drive him around to check those boxes during the last three years or so, that he was able to do it, well, he's going to take over some of them, try to check on them a couple times a year to make sure they're still up and working. But he isn't collecting data or banding birds like Al did. For some perspective, Al says he used to go out there every 10 days to check on his boxes. Al Larson is also a surviving World War II veteran. He served three years with the Marine Corps Signal Battalion in the Pacific Theater, and he's celebrating his 102nd birthday in Cascade. Happy birthday, Al.
lot of neat shots from Idaho weather watchers as these storm systems have been moving through. We're going to see more of those here over the next few days. Outside right now, there's a little bit of sunshine. I've been, this is a live shot from Skycam 7 on top of the Channel 7 roof. And as you take a look at this, you can see the sunshine out there now. I've saw snow, I've seen rain. Uh, yeah, there's all kinds of things that have been moving through the area. So the temperature, and our, which is our high so far, is about 52 degrees. Temperatures are in the lower 50s and even the upper 40s for Twin Falls. Let me just, for kicks, let me throw in the wind chill. 43 degrees out there, so the wind's blowing about 5 to 10 miles an hour. It makes a big difference. This is uh, how the temperatures are going to warm up, looking at just the normal temperatures over the next few months. Uh, as we get into April, the... Um, uh, temperature on an average will be about 59 degrees. That's the normal temperature on the 1st of April. On the 1st of May, it's 67. On the 1st of June, it's 77, which means, yes, you could have temperatures in the 80s, maybe warmer. And then on July 1st, it's 88 degrees. That's the warmest time of the year. And that means temperatures that could be in the 90s or even, even warmer than that. So it's close. It's coming in. So here's a look at the snapshot here of the storm system that moved through. You can see the yellows along through there, a thunderstorm that's south of town. As we look at it for this evening, there's still those scattered showers. They're going to be coming in at night. Looks like it's going to let up right out here through southern Oregon as that moves through early tomorrow morning. But then the clouds will increase about late morning. It's very short lived and that's uh, more rain that's going to be coming into the area. In fact, we could be seeing late Wednesday night into Thursday, quarter of an inch of rain, maybe some spots a little bit more with that storm system coming through. So it's not going to be just off and on, but we're going to see periods of rain showers. As you get into Friday and Saturday, it's off and on. There's those scattered showers or so, and the temperatures are starting to come up. Can you wait for this one next Monday and Tuesday? Those high temperatures are going to be getting into the 60s, and at this point, it looks like we do have sunshine.
All right, let's put a bow on this Tuesday with some of your comments, like this one from Barb in CUNY wants to know, what specifically was the name calling by Democrats that Representative Blanksman was referring to? Well, Julie from Boise said, I was at that press conference last Friday. Name calling? No. Offers to address these issues across the aisle? Absolutely. Methinks the Republican Party doth protest too much. I find it very interesting that a scheduled meeting with, an, with Idaho physicians was canceled because the poor Republicans feel picked on. Maybe they're simply afraid they might have to face the truth about their actions, says Carol. About that canceled hearing on women's health care, Republicans once again burying their heads in the sand. Idaho has a very real crisis on their hands, but would rather continue to control rather than educate and protect. Why am I surprised, says Cindy. We've heard these same things from doctors and health systems. Hospitals, St. Luke's, St. Alphonse is telling us the same thing. These doctors are leaving. And this is why, and at least part of the reason why. So they were going to tell the lawmakers themselves. Thankfully, we had legislators who focus on laws solving problems we don't have rather than wasting time hearing from professionals talking about real world impacts of existing laws, says Jerry. It's a good point. Great story on Al, the bird man. I've seen his bird boxes in Prairie and have taken wonderful photos because of his dedicated work. Larry says, thank you, Al, for all the work you've done. And uh, yeah, he's enjoying his time up in Cascade right now, not getting out as much as he wants to, but still seeing those birds, as he says. The Bluebird Man is a living example of, well, that to which we should all aspire. Make the world, Idaho, a better place every day. Good words to live by, Lori. Thanks for sending those in, and we'll see you again tomorrow.